Taylor, of all the people I've talked to on this podcast, you are one of the most anticipated guests I've ever had. I'm so excited to talk to you about your book and also about your work. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Okay, your book, Extremely Online, The Untold Story of Fame, Influence, and Power on the Internet. It's published. I mean, it's coming out now, really, this week. Uh, so tell me, before we even get into your past, I do want to know, just briefly, where did the idea of this book come from? Yeah, I decided to write this book, um, I mean, basically in 2020. Um, I wanted to write a book. I, I'm a, you know, I've covered the social media landscape for over a decade. Since 2009, I started blogging about all this stuff. And I wanted to write a history of the rise of social media, not through the lens of these corporate tech narratives. Because I think when a lot of people think of the rise of social media, they think of like the social network and they sort of like these books that are sort of like told, they, they, they tell the rise of social media through the lens of specific companies. And I wanted to zoom out and tell the user side and talk about the content creator side, because social products are so unique in the tech world, because the value that they, that comes from them is, is not really the software, it's the users on them, it's the community. And so, you know, you can create a Twitter clone like Donald Trump did, for instance, with Truth Social, but unless you have that network, you know, you don't have the value. So I think I wanted to write about the, the users of the social platforms and how that contributed to, t to this whole world, because I think we, we only hear the tech company side usually. Okay. Well, speaking of sides that we're going to hear, we are going to come back uh, and talk about your book more extensively. But before we get there, we have to talk about you because you are a unique byproduct only almost of what you cover, which is internet culture. So right now you are, do you consider yourself a technology columnist? Uh, that is my job title at the Washington Post. Okay, so that's so, yeah. your job. Okay, so that's your job title. What would you call yourself then, just overall? I think I'm a lot of things. I mean, I'm obviously I started as a blogger and a content creator, and I'll always be a content creator and a blogger at heart. I don't really blog as much anymore because I write for the Post. But I mean, I'm also a journalist, and I, that's definitely like my day job. But I think, like a lot of people, I have my day job and my passion. But I also use the internet, and I have built an audience, you know, about the things that I care about online. I think, you know, two descriptions about you, the Bob Woodward of the TikTok generation, and then also you were named Tech and Media Influencer of the Year by the World Influencers and Bloggers Association. I, I, I think really that those are two descriptions that pretty much capture you, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really honored by that stuff. I always just joke that I'm the oldest person on my beat. So they have to give me the accolades. <laughs> my gosh, the oldest person on your beat. Oh my goodness. My, I feel old even just hearing that. But so let's talk about, let's just go back in time for a bit. So share with me and the listeners, what initially sparked your interest in internet culture? And particularly I noticed your connection to Tumblr. That was a that was a, a network that you used to use. Yeah, Tumblr gave me literally everything in life. Um, <laughs> I mean, I graduated like a lot of millennials into the recession. Um, back in 2008, there was no jobs. And so, yeah, in 2009, I was working temp jobs. I was working retail, um, just, you know, trying to figure out what to do with my life. And then I got on Tumblr and um, it, I mean, it was like night and day, like suddenly I felt like, oh my God, there's this whole wide world out there on the internet and uh, the blog world and I could publish on it. And that just felt so liberating. I was like, well, I have some opinions. <laughs> so, so where did you go to school and what was your major? Oh my God. I went to a couple different schools. I went to University of Colorado um, for three years and then I ended up transferring to Hobart and William Smith. Um, which I graduated from. And then I also did a short time at American University in DC in between. Okay. I, I had a really hard time in school. I'm going to be real. I was failing a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, okay. So uh, where you're originally from, is it Connecticut? You're originally from? Uh, yeah, okay. I lived in Connecticut. Oh. Now my, then my family moved to Colorado, but Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then you're, okay. I, that was my first question. How do you go from Connecticut to University of Colorado? So I, I think this is important because I do have a lot of younger people, college students, um, people just out of college who are always asking me questions, you know, about my job, but you admitting right now, a very kind of vulnerable part of your past is that you struggled in college. What was it that you struggled with? Yeah, I, so I'm severely dyslexic and I have also severe ADHD, which I don't take medication for or anything. Um, and so school was very, very hard for me. I transferred a lot. I had a, I 
really had a hard time in school. And, you know, I, growing up in the 90s, now there's an understanding of a lot of these things. In the 90s, it was like, okay, you're just an idiot and you're going to be put in these sort of classes with sometimes developmentally disabled people. And just, it, you know, so it was a hard situation. And I felt very bored all the time because I was, I think, smart enough. And, um, but I just wasn't very good at reading and, um, and kind of just the, the stuff that came along with, yeah, school. Anyway, I never did well in school. So what I did is worked and I started working at age 11 and I, I worked, I mean, I, I've had, I think I made a list. I have almost 50 jobs in my life. Like mm -hmm. I had nine internships in college. Like the one thing I've always done is I'm a worker and, um, not in, not in the school context, but yeah, that's what got me all my, I mean, that's what got me. Like, I think it helped me a lot when I started to get traction with my blogging career, because I had worked a lot of places and I had interned a lot of places and I had a lot of like sort of knowledge from things like that. Um, I tried to be in PR, Molly, you would appreciate that. Well, I, I see, I, it, this is what I had to ask because sitting in front of me is a book of almost 300 pages of the most well-researched articles and points in time. I mean, this book is incredible here. And, and the fact that you're, uh, you're a, a columnist, I mean, you're writing the amount of content, you have a newsletter and you're telling me that you're dyslexic and you have ADHD and that you struggle <laughs> with, that's so interesting. So are you telling me that it's really just like hard work and focus no. and a passion? So what no, is it that got through it? I think it's alternative. I think it's alternative learning. And I think a lot of kids with learning disabilities are in, I went to public school. My whole life I was in public school and I think public school is great, but it's not set up for alternative learning methods. You're very much like, especially in the nineties, when I was a kid, it was like, you go, you know, you learn this way. And if you don't learn that way too bad, you must be an idiot. And, um, I'm a big believer in sort of like self-directed learning and other sort of just all the different, I mean, I'm not an expert in education by any means, but like, I think there's a lot more ways to teach people things that they need to know. And so a lot of it was people outside of work that I interned for that mentored me or that taught me things. Um, I've, I've always had a really good relationship with almost ever, every boss that I've ever worked for and they've helped me so much. What type of internships were you drawn to? Was it anything with content writing journalism? Uh, no, never journalism. I didn't really consider that until I started blogging and then I met journalists. But um, I wanted to be, I, I always wanted to be in sort of like culture and media. I did a bunch of fashion internships. I did an internship, a couple internships at like political consulting firms that did advertising for political candidates. I interned for an artist, a local artist in town. It was always like creative fields. I think I was, I knew I would be in a creative field. I just didn't know like what creative Feel. See, this makes sense to me. And and I'm just like you. I mean, I've been a newsie my whole life, but I wanted to split myself into 10 different pieces because I wanted to work in television programming, television advertising, television sales, journalism. I wanted to be at an ad agency. I want, you know, I just loved media and culture just like you. And when you, it, when you discovered Tumblr, it sounds like it's the same time that I just started adjuncting as a professor at a school and I was using Tumblr for the students. And no yeah, so I, I was new to it myself, but one thing that I remember about it, it was just so open. I mean, there were no rules. It was just, you could do whatever you could do. So I'm not surprised to hear that that's really the starting point for your creativity and probably confidence too, correct? Yeah. Well, also because there was no judgment and I think it was a lot of other young women too that were on Tumblr at that time. Mm -hmm. And I could write and I didn't, feel like I, you know, there was some sort of thing. I could just be myself and have my own voice and develop my own sort of sense of humor. And yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. And Tumblr to me will always be the, is it a blue dress or a gold dress? Like that was, that was Tumblr <laughs> to me. That's in my book. Oh yes, I know. So now let's move over now. I'm dying to know about this. So you, we'd say that you have a diverse career in journalism. I mean, from the outside, a broader look, that's, you know, that's what it is to me right now. You spent time at the Daily Mail. Yes, yeah, so that was my first media job. Yes. Yeah, so tell me how you got the job and what job did you have in particular there? Yeah. So I had, because of my success on Tumblr, I had brands asking me to do things. This was before, like, this was a real industry. Like, Facebook had just launched Facebook pages in 2009 and, like, people wanted branded Tumblrs. But there was, so I got a job at an ad agency doing branded social media for brands, mainly Verizon. And, um, but I love the Daily Mail. I, I'm the same as you. I love news. I've yeah. always like been a huge, I love just information. And I would sit down every day and read the Daily Mail homepage, top to bottom every morning. 
And I was like, I noticed that they didn't have a Facebook page. They didn't have a Facebook page. They didn't really have social media. So I, um, yeah, I ended up my, this guy, Rob, that I knew, knew the publisher. He connected me with the publisher and I met the publisher, Martin Clark, and I convinced him to hire me. I was like, basically like I made this whole PowerPoint presentation and I was like, you don't understand. I found it recently. I was like the internet, we, you are, you are missing things because the daily mail could go crazy. Just let me set up a Facebook page and I promise you. So he let me set up the Facebook page. First, he was like, just for the US, you just do a little thing. I'll hire you in New York just for the US. And then within a couple of months, he was like, okay, you're taking over the global social strategy. Oh, you can hire a team goodness. of 12, like all over the world. I managed, I mean, I did everything. I built that whole brand on the internet. Oh. And it was, I love tabloid news. It was a great brand to build. Okay, first, so tell me, I mean, I was just like you. There was a time I read it. It was first thing I read every morning, though I would yeah. never admit that, you know, like, I you know, know. that <laughs> and you go to a tabloid first. First was the New York Post, and then all of a sudden, you know, Daily Mail shows up. Who owns the Daily Mail? Um, it's owned by DMG Media Group, which is sort of like the, it's a British conglomerate. They also own a bunch of other, okay. like Metro UK and a bunch of ones like that. Okay. It's not Murdoch. Yes. Okay. So then, um, so now tell me, what is it? So were you just running the social media or were you do any of, were you doing any of the reporting? Oh yeah. I started reporting. So, I mean, everything I learned about journalism, unfortunately, yes! <laughs> I learned at the Daily Mail, um, which is not necessarily a lot about like, the ethics uh, of journalism? Like the ethics of journalism. <laughs> okay. It was more about like how to tell a story and how to get people into a story. I'll never forget Martin Clark. One time we were in this meeting not long after I started and there was a whale that came from the Hudson River and, and the headline was the, it said, um, whale seen for the second time on the Hudson River. And he had this, he, and he started yelling at the reporter and he was like, it's not that, it, it's the whale that can't stay away. The whale that's fallen in love with New York and it can't stay away. And he was so good at things like that. He would see things and he would see the story and like kind of like char put characters. Anyway, I learned everything from Martin and um, there's this editor, Catherine Thompson there too, who's just incredible. There were a lot of really amazing editors and I learned how to oh, okay, but tell a story. So that storytelling, that it, to me, that sounds like a great anecdote for writing fiction. Yeah, but it's not, it's true for journalism too, because it's what you want to do is it's the truth. The truth is like, right, like you're telling the truth, but you're telling it in a compelling way. In that sense, obviously you're giving like an animal that's clearly probably just lost <laughs> twice. Like yeah. you're telling this narrative, but that's what you're doing with media all the time. Like every journalist knows that to, to you have to make a compelling narrative. Otherwise people aren't going to read your story. That narrative does need to be truthful. Right. <laughs> ideally. Right. Although a lot of journalism is not unfortunately truthful, but journalists, you know, you need to, it's, it's storytelling at the end of the day. And so I think that's what tabloid news does very well. Okay. So the, the problem is they sacrifice accuracy. Yeah. For, okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. But so, so tell me some of the secrets though, in terms of the daily mail. I mean, it's incredibly, incredibly popular. I will admit, I don't go to it anymore. I mean, just yeah. was, there's so many other um, social media apps that, you know, kind of scratch that itch, but yeah. what was the magic formula at uh, the daily mail that made it so successful back then? Yeah, especially back then, because it, it was sort of like this perfect marriage of like the type of news that performed really well online. And if you could format it really well online, like it would just go crazy. And I got very good. You know, they're famous for these long headlines, but I only had 70 characters to write the Facebook headline. And so I got very good at distilling, you know, these like sort of like drama stories, like into these like really quick, like Facebook headlines. Um, and I mean, I, I would say what they do is they're very democratic. Like they're very, this is something I've always appreciated about tabloid news. Like they don't, they're not like too highbrow to cover something. Like they will oh, just, yeah. they recognize a good story and they'll go after it. And I, I think I like, it trained me very well in the sense that like, there's so much elitism in media, mm -hmm. especially even just about like who we cover. And um, I don't love the like political leanings of the Daily Mail at all. And they do a lot of like really predatory coverage, but I always tried to share the best of it on Facebook. And the stories that I wrote were mostly about internet stuff. Early, vi it was early virality. I started writing about basically like early content creator stuff. Okay. So one more question about it and then I'll move on because I could, we could spend the entire uh, <laughs> interview about that. Um, I, I notice when I would read the Daily Mail, uh, it, to me, it appeared that the, uh, the reporters, the writers or the reporters behind it, they were just mining U.S. Yeah. news. I mean, so what were you reading? Like the wires, like, or were you going to all these different news sites? Yeah. 
the goal is basically to like aggregate the internet. And, and that was like the whole thing is like you, you you'd scroll around on local news on, I used to have this thing called Feedly that I would check mm-hmm. um, to like, see if there were viral stories popping. Cause when there were viral stories popping, I would always flag them to editors to cover so that I could get the link to share on Facebook. Or sometimes I would cover it myself. Um, but yeah, I was using, I mean, that was back when like Google reader was around. I mean, there was like, it was a different, like it was really easy to kind of like scan publications, but And then I would get a lot from the internet too. Like uh, that was the era. And I talk about this in my book actually about like the early 2010s, digital media was this intermediary for the internet. Actually, the dress is the perfect example. It's like you as a digital media worker would go on the internet, you would take something viral from the internet, but people weren't really online enough yet to consume it natively on the platform it was posted. So you had to like post it on a website. So a lot of it was just like, you know, what is it? Arbitrary. Arbitrage. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Content arbitrage, like mm-hmm. where you sort of like use like, ooh, that's viral. That would go really crazy. Or like, ooh, that Reddit thread would be really good. I could I just need somebody to quickly aggregate it in 90 minutes and get it up on the website. So now then tell me about the hierarchy or really of authority and news. You went from the Daily Mail, but now you end up at the New York Times. So how did well, that happen? I was, yeah, I was very senior. I had like very senior management companies in media. I, I mean, I was the youngest woman in senior management at the Daily Mail at the time. And then I went on to be um, director of emerging platforms for The Hill, where I launched, I launched, a, I helped um, do content strategy for this brand under People Magazine. And I thought I would work in biz dev. Like I was like, I'm going to launch my own media company because I always wanted to have my own media company. And like, I thought I would work in business and strategy. Um, but then I felt like people don't take you seriously in journalism unless you've been a reporter. And I wanted to write the stories. It was really hard to get people even when I was senior, I would have my own little like content people. It was really hard to get people to care about the internet and see it as like a, me- a meaningful place to like write critically and like really examine this stuff and not just like write up the cheap viral Facebook stuff, but like zoom out and write about this whole industry that's emerging. And so I started doing more and more of that writing. I was always writing, but I started really writing sort of critically about the internet more and more. And uh, yeah, I actually, I filled in as a social media editor for The Atlantic um, for a week mm-hmm. once over the holidays. Yeah. This was back in the day when like, I don't know, we, we were in these social media Facebook groups and they were like, I need someone to run The Atlantic. And they let me in the Slack. And once I got in the Slack, yeah. I was like, by the way, I'm a writer. Oh. <laughs> Can I pitch some stories? <laughs> and they were like, this girl that we hired to do the Twitter account for a week, like wants to pitch stories about the internet, but I and what wrote happened? a story. Okay. They gave you one. I wrote All a right. feature. They assigned me a feature. I got a, I got it. I, one of the editors there assigned me a feature about what was back in 2016 or 2017. It was about what happens when your child blows up online. And I interviewed all these parents about how they were navigating the sort of shifting power dynamics of their children having online fame. And it was a feature that did very well for the Atlantic. And they were, they, anyway, so the Atlantic couldn't hire me full time at that time because I hadn't been a reporter. Mm-hmm. So I got the Daily Beast to hire me. I took a massive, I took a 75% pay cut mm-hmm. and I moved in with a bunch of friends in Crown Heights. And I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna be a reporter for a year and make nothing. I'll make an entry level salary again for a year, but at least I'll have some clips under my belt. And then um, within six months, the Atlantic hired me. And then from the Atlantic, I went to the New York Times. And then from the Times, I went to the Post. Oh, it's incredible. Okay. So now I know that we're just going to weave in and out in terms of where you were, where you were writing at the time and what happened to you. But I think you, I, I get a sense. How do you navigate being a journalist and writing a fair and balanced account of what happened without imposing your opinion? Because, I mean, you are an authority in internet culture. So how do you, how do you balance that when you're writing stories for the post, for instance? Yeah. I mean, I think the core is to tell the truth of the situation. Um, and I do add analysis in my story. I, I think it's fine to add analysis or opinion, as long as you're explicit that this is just your opinion. Sometimes I write stories that do include my own sort of take on things. I think what's disingenuous is just when reporters include that and don't make it clear that this is just their sort of take. So, I mean, especially at the Atlantic, I was writing a lot of like reported takes. That's really what the Atlantic is known for. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was always very open with like, this is my opinion on it. Um, I think, I mean, look, I think journalism is a very subjective field. And I think that um, even just how you cover a story, who you interview, every single little choice you make is subjective and it's not, you know. And so I think good journalists don't mind busting their preconceived notions. The bad journalists are the ones that have the preconceived notions do the reporting and then just use that to validate their preconceived notions. I think a good journalist, I'm a very curious person. There's so many stories that I set out to do 
that I had one idea about the story and then you report and you talk to people and you realize it's a different story. And that's, you, you need to be like open and willing to accept that. What are the boundaries at the Washington Post when it comes to reporting and are they different for reporters? Yeah. I mean, every media company is really different and I think they kind of have different editorial standards. I will say the Post and the Times and the Atlantic all have like very high editorial standards compared to places that I worked at earlier in my career that didn't have those mm-hmm. restrictions of things, you know, you can't go on like free trips to Tahiti and then write about it or something, you know, like, yes. um, but I mean, I cover, I cover internet culture. So I guess the main thing is like, I, you know, I just try to be fair about the internet landscape. And it seems they, it seems like from reading your coverage, they give you some leeway there. Like they know you're an authority. They know that you have to yeah. push the, push the envelope just a little. Well, I usually make, yeah. I mean, I usually am making a point with my story. So it's usually like this matters. Why does this matter? Because X, Y, Z. And I would say that's, re- that's based on reporting. I mean, like for instance, with the like libs of TikTok story that people were so mad at me about, you know, cause I revealed the woman behind libs of TikTok. Um, I will defend that story forever. I mean, is it an ideological choice to write about her? Maybe, but the point is, is that she was shaping, you know, Ron DeSantis's press secretary said that her account directly impacted the legislation that he wrote in Florida. Florida. Also, that account was basically an assignment editor for all of Fox News. This is a hugely influential account in media. And by the way, she was doing interviews anonymously. So she had a role in the press. She was a public figure. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I made the decision to do that. And, and I totally stand by it. But um, I think we all make those types of sort of like choices as reporters. It's just about being honest and open and clear about it. What was the conversation like in the newsroom with your editors around that whole story? I was like, I'm going to find out who this woman is because she was, she had not been, um, she had not been reported. No, people didn't have her identity. Public. Could you do and, a backstory on it real quick for anyone yeah. not familiar with it? So this woman, Chaya Rychek, um, started this account, Libs of TikTok. It's a Twitter account that was doxing LGBTQ teachers. It has called for LGBTQ people to be run out of schools, for gay parents to be criminalized. She doesn't believe that gay, you know, gay parents should have be able to have children. Um, you know, she became this hugely influential figure because she's been cited on Joe Rogan and a lot of other sort of like um actually like the Fox News universe, like right wing, basically every time she would tweet something, I mean, there were bomb threats against hospitals that she talked about that were providing gender affirming therapy. So she had become this pivotal figure in the right wing media. And they were really taking direction from her for a while. Like she was popular, Tucker Carlson, which she would tweet something, it would be on Tucker Carlson the next night. And then Ron DeSantis, of course, as well. And these political leaders on the right were also looking to her account while they're writing anti-gay legislation. Mm -hmm. I think somebody like that, that's that level of a public figure that's shaping our media environment, that's shaping the laws in our country, we need to know who that person is. And they have millions of followers online, by the way, as well. So my feeling was, I am going to report on this person's identity. I didn't dox her. I didn't expose any personal information, nothing related to her address, nothing related to anything. It's actually, her name is actually quite common in the Jewish community. So there was really nothing that, that that I reported that would allow you to like sort of, um, you know, expose any kind of like personal information about her, which is what doxing is. However, did I report on her identity? Yes, I did. I think it's very important. And I would argue in the public interest to know who this person is, because when we don't know who these people are that are shaping these things, she could have, you know, who knows what her background is. If she had taken money from someone, this is in the public interest. Yes. That obviously caused a lot of controversy (laughs) because people were very mad. Yes. And um, I stand by that reporting. I think I did the right thing. So tell me about the backlash. What was that like having almost an entire segment. I mean, we have the left and the right, and now they were all coming after you. What was that experience like for you? Well, so one thing people were really angry at is that I went to her door and um, I went to her door because I had tried to call her several times and she she was hanging up on me. And so I wasn't able to confirm that she didn't want to give comment. It's really important if you're writing about the subject, this was a profile piece, right? Like about her and about her account. So I really wanted to make sure that I gave her every single opportunity to say that she didn't want to comment. Totally fine if you don't want to comment, but I didn't want to just try to call and she hung up Mm -hmm. thinking I'm spam call. Mm -hmm. She lived a mile from me. I found her address and I thought I'm going to knock on her door and just triple make sure that she doesn't want to give comment. 
What did she do? She tweets a picture of me on her doorstep. She says, you know, Taylor Lorenz is showing up at my house. I'm like, yes, I politely asked for comment. She declined comment and I left. That's all it was. Um, but, you know, it led to, um, unfortunately, a lot of backlash from me because I think people don't understand the process of reporting and they think, oh, well, you show up at her house, we'll show up at your house, you know? And exactly. so it led to a lot of sort of threats and um, scary stuff. But Yeah, I can imagine. And the, the weaponization of what happened to you, but really when you just look at journalism and beat reporting, look at all the movies where they have a journalist. What do they do? Yes. They knock on the door to get the, to get the quote, you know, they, they yes. want to get the quote. They, you, exactly. you were not only doing your job, you were doing it well. You were letting her know you were going through all the paces there to make sure that she did have a chance to go on the record. And yes, that, and that she was prepared. Yeah. Also, she knew everything that I would talk about. You know, I I wanted to give her a chance to really respond to everything. And, you know, so So I have to ask you about a question and I didn't I didn't tell you about this in advance and you can tell me you don't want to talk about it, but yeah. involving um the the controversy if you will with a colleague um with Dave Portnoy and recording. Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so funny, Molly, because I did a podcast with Dave Portnoy recently. You did? Dave has not posted it. Dave has not posted it. So Dave, if you're listening, where's the podcast episode with me? I think I did a very good job and held my own on that podcast. Okay. So um, now, so it's Emily Heil. Is that who the reporter is? Yes. And I, I feel very bad for her because here's the thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say about all of that. And I, th I know Emily and I know them to be very good reporters. The, not everybody is covers the internet. You know, these are food reporters. And so they're sort of reaching out and, you know, not everybody knows the type of person that Dave is. I, I cover the content creator world. I have, I call people for comment. They're often live streaming on Twitch, you know, like, right. or something. Yeah. They, they, it's just, it's going to be turned into content. So I'm aware of that. I think a lot of other reporters, it's hard to kind of navigate that type of a thing because they aren't, used to dealing with a person like that, but. Okay, so here's the question. We don't want to spend too much time on this, but this really is interesting because so many people have tagged me on this story and I have I have opinions on Dave Portnoy, certainly. Um, I, he's, you know, like, you know, first there was how he turned the whole pizza, uh, yeah. you know, like it's almost like he's getting a taste of his own medicine. And then a reporter comes asking questions. What do you think, though, like he's trying to expose her showing um, bias in her reporting and he recorded her and just just to give a little background. So uh, he's hosting a one bite pizza festival or he hosted it in Brooklyn and uh, the Washington Post reporter. So Emily Heil. So are you saying that she's typically just a restaurant critic or a writer? I believe she's I believe she's a food writer. I will just say these are phenomenal reporters. Yeah. Like these are not just like some like off the street, random 22 year olds. These are really good reporters. And you, one snippet of an email that's taken out of context is not representative of the reporting process that I know that our reporters go through. And she is a very good reporter. I think what Dave does very well is leverage things for attention. And Absolutely. That is his prerogative. Like that's what yes. I'm saying of like reporters need to be prepared these days to deal with the, with somebody like that because they are going to take a, I mean, it's happened to me all the time. Yes. They take one email, they ignore the larger context. Sometimes they only read part of the email, you know, mm -hmm. and it's used to discredit you. Well, and that story, when I read it and followed it, it reminded me of you. There was someone <laughs> doing their job. And to me, yeah. that that's a news angle. Like, I, I don't know how I pronounced it. He, it was, uh, misog what did he say? Mis misogyst or something. He kept yeah, mispronouncing he it. Pronounce it. Misogyny. <laughs> and, but there, but historically he's done that in the past. And so her story about, you know, um, asking the sponsors there, I think that's a valid story and he 100%. leveraged it. And I also think not only is it leverage, but it's also a distraction from what's really going on at Barstool, but that's just my opinion. A hundred percent. Also, let's be clear again, like you do not know the reporting process and uh, journalists will often sort of say things privately directly to a source because again, you want to get a certain response or you want to sort of get them to respond to you. And it, it's just, it's very misrepresentative to take one thing. That said, we all know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I mean, it's, I just feel bad for sort of like the reporter. And I believe that media companies should allow their journalists to talk about these things. Because the one big mistake that, that I've noticed when I've been through these cycles before, and trust me, I've been in this situation so many times before, you have to respond and you have to be, you have to get on there. You have to be like, actually, here's what's really going on. 
let me tell you what's it. And let me tell you about my reporting process. And let me answer your concerns because my, you know, this is, and sort of just be an, be more of an open book. I think media companies tend to retreat and mm-hmm. lock up because they don't want to make it worse. And that can, that actually, unfortunately, usually exacerbates it. Yes. Because they don't want to expose how, how they get to the source oh, and get to the news. So, 100%. so where in the past do you feel in, in your coverage or where there's been blowback in the coverage, where, where did the, where did the, the, uh, newspaper, uh, fall behind or what did they do wrong in terms of the response? It sounds like you touched on it right now that they didn't speak so many out. times. I, I mean, I think, well, I think it's like, I mean, one thing I've learned from working in legacy media, um, and again, I don't know Emily, by the way, I don't know the other reporters at the post. I just know like people's reputations. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to like say that like, these are really well-respected reporters that everyone in the newsroom really respects and loves. These are not some like fringe reporters, like right. going after mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but okay. So here's what I would say. Um, one thing I've learned is you respond early and very directly and clearly. So for instance, um, you know, I've had a lot of things happen where people, maybe they take one little thing in your story. They'll take a little, like a who knows what, I I mean, some, sometimes they'll just fixate on a line or they'll take an email that you sent somebody or they'll take, you know, whatever. And then it's used to kind of discredit you. And if you don't squash that narrative soon, that becomes a dominant narrative. Mm -hmm. And you, and then often media reporters will pick it up because media reporters, I have to say, I think are like some of the, you know, there's good ones and there's bad ones, but the bad ones are really bad. Um, they're just like little like trolls that sit on Twitter looking for media drama. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you have to, you have to respond early because when you clam up, there is a presumption of guilt. Oh, w- without a doubt. So what do you think is happening at the Washington Post? Do you, so obviously they're limiting. I have ability. absolutely no idea. I, I have no idea. And I'm totally not involved in any of that. I am just living my life in LA. <laughs> I just, I just like, I just have to say as somebody that has dealt with and deals with influencers 24 seven, I have so much empathy for any reporter that gets caught in these type of cycles. Yes. Because it's a, it's a, it's, it's a meat grinder. And unless you handle it well, it can really be exhausting, but I, I trust that they are. Yeah. So I, I mean, I felt for her and what I assume is that she's not allowed to speak out, but if it were me, if I were an editor there, I would sit her down. I've been to that newsroom. They have the cameras right in the middle of the newsroom, do an interview, talk about the journalism process, like how to build a story, what she did. I think a lot of people can read between the lines and know exactly what's going on, but there's a lot of people in this culture who's not getting it. It gives a guy like Portnoy the leg up. I think generally, I think on a broad, and I definitely can't like, you know, comment on sort of like the specifics because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't, don't even work in the newsroom, but I will say, I think generally we need to be more open and transparent about our journalistic process and answer our readers' questions. That's what I try to do on social media every day because it actually builds trust. And look, I've fucked up before for sure. Like I've like, you know, made a mistake here and there or something, but I'm open about it and I respond to it and I acknowledge it and answer questions. Cause that's how you build trust. You don't build trust by sort of just retreating. And I think that's what a lot of companies do because they are, they don't, you know, it's, they don't know how to operate on the internet. Absolutely. And that's why you and I are so busy. <laughs> both, of our, <laughs> both of our perspectives. Um, so then let's now on that topic, let's discuss Depp versus Heard and the trial, which I felt like just kind of created a new watermark when it when it's the intersection of legal court cases with internet culture opinion mixed in with technology algorithm and bots so talk about that your your involvement in that trial your coverage from that trial and just your thoughts on it yeah so i didn't cover the trial itself i watched it um and i sort of watched the internet around it and i talked to a lot of big content creators. Um, and one thing I, I noticed is sort of that they they kept saying is like they're incentivized to post anti-Amber Heard content, that that was what was performing really well was anti-Amber and pro-Johnny content. I think this is really interesting because they were able to gain a huge amount of audience and a huge amount of money. And so I interviewed several content creators with millions and millions of followers that actually didn't have any real opinions on the trial at all but they were putting out 24 seven pro Johnny Depp content because it was performing really well on their pages. And so I talked about the incentive structures at play and how the internet, especially with misogyny, like I think a lot of this stuff that they were putting out and I, 
you know, some of these people are my longtime sources and I respect them, but like they're putting out extremely misogynistic stuff about like Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. And those videos were just doing really well because they played into this misogynistic hate. Absolutely. And by yeah. the way, yeah, I, I have to say one other thing, Adam Waldman, uh, Depp's old yeah. lawyer, recognized this very early and actually was feeding information to content creators throughout the trial as well, which he had. Okay. Said, so. so that's where I wanted to get into. So when you talk about, you know, when, when people, when there's an, Oh, this is the word incentivization of, you yeah. know, content. It's advertising. It's well, you know, it's, it's watch hour, watch time, you know, connected to advertising, you know, YouTube, whatever it is. But what about intentional? We are going to give you money to cover this or to have this perspective, you know, pro, pro dep. Did you, what have you found about that in any of your reporting? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like people, it wasn't the dep team giving people money necessarily, although maybe they did. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just more interested in these sort of like neutral creators that were like, I don't actually care. I just want my engagement to go through the roof so I can sell more ads next month. And that's just, that seemed to be the majority of people that I talked to. Yes, there's these trolls. Yes, there's these people affiliated with Gamergate and Comicsgate that are the true misogynistic trolls. And by the way, those were the ones that of course wanted to come after me in the article. Those are minor characters. They actually don't have very big followings. They're kind of these like niche, like troll internet people. The real notable thing that I was concerned with in my story was these big, content creators that, that again, were agnostic about the trial, but just noticed that this specific type of content did well. And that's, and that really helped that really shaped the narrative. I think the public's narrative about it. All. Oh, absolutely. And in your book, and I had it out and now I've lost the part of it, but I, I guess I know where it is. Cause, um, I, I covered this as, as an adjunct in one of my, you know, teaching one of my college classes is the prevalence of alt-right uh, just content, but really how far it goes back. Like it's, it's actually a format. It's a framework that is designed around making money on the internet. So it's not new to the Depp Heard trial. It goes back many, many years. So in your book, you do talk about alt-right trolls and, and what happened around Trump's campaign. Could you touch on that for a bit? Yeah. I mean, I covered the 2016 election when I was at the Hill. And I think one thing that Trump did very early is leverage the internet and specifically leverage these internet communities to mainstream his campaign and generate grassroots support and stuff. Um, I mean, I'll never forget. It was, I think it was Trump's inauguration weekend. Even he had, there was this event called the Deplora Ball. And it was literally just a big party of all of the most right-wing content creators I've ever seen. I was looking around the room like, wow, every major YouTuber content creator on the alt-right is basically in this room. Um, and I think those people played a key role in the rise of Trump and they've played a key role in the rise of other people like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates or a lot of these sort of more extreme right political figures. Um, and, you know, the right wing media ecosystem is so different than sort of the traditional media ecosystem in that they embraced the Internet and content creator world very early. And that's always there's always been that like sort of energy on the right, you know, like even with right wing talk radio, like a lot of those people got into podcasting early. They've always really understood the power of the internet and the power of, of this new media ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that has not been replicated elsewhere on the political spectrum. Yeah. And for people who have been around a while, like myself, like I remembered the earlier iterations of Donald Trump, you know, media Donald Trump, moderate Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And it's as if he figured out that money is so tied into and connected to the alt right that that is what drove him to. It's not ide it's not the ideology behind it. It's just the dollar signs and the base and building it. Yeah, it really it's profit. It is. That's really what it comes down to and building that base. So I just noticed that there is someone following that Donald Trump playbook as of last week, Russell Brand. I, you and I didn't talk about this or I didn't even prep you with this at all, but tell me about what Russell Brand is doing. So his first video that he dropped, you know, from these accusations, you know, from reporting uh, over in London, you know, a joint investigation about him and that was coming out on a Sunday, but on Friday he drops a video. So talk about what you believe his strategy is right now, based also on your research, just on this type of topic. Yeah, I mean, Russell is doing exactly the, the playbook that's been sort of well tried before. It's like declare cancel culture. First of all, he recognized that these allegations were coming. He spent years building up his audience in anticipation and kind of positioning himself as this like 
anti, you know, media sort of person. Of course, he's backed by the same billionaires as everyone else. He's on Rumble, Peter Thiel's, you know, yeah. YouTube mm-hmm. alternative. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just, it's so funny how like all these people are just like funded by right wing billionaires, but then try to act like they're the independent media. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see him sort of railing against the media and saying that this is all a coordinated campaign to like take him down because he's outside the mainstream. And um, I, it's it's this positioning yourself as the underdog that I think that they do a lot, despite the fact that they have so much political power, so much economic power. It's this sort of like root for me because I'm, you know, I'm the I'm getting taken down. You know, these women are coming after me when it's obviously not the case. And and also the difference is certainly, you know, former President uh, Trump, he is the one that, you know, created the playbook. I'll, I'll give him that, you know, built off of other playbooks, previous playbooks. But he has significant legal challenges ahead of him. So for yeah. Russell Brand to follow that same playbook, he has the same. That's the one thing about their playbooks. They don't, there isn't a chapter in there about how to deal with the legal consequence of what they're dealing with. So what do you think is going to happen with Russell Brand? I don't know. I think it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. I do think that we're in this, like, there's this, like, resurgence of pretty virulent misogyny on the internet, Mm -hmm. like, that the Amber Heard sort of trial ushered in. I mean, if you look to the conversation around, like, Marilyn Manson and those accusations against him, and just, like, there's been a lot of kind of backlash since the Me Too movement against women that come forward on the internet. And I I mean, I talk in my book about Gamergate as this playbook, Mm -hmm. and it's notable that a lot of people actually involved in these campaigns to this day were birthed out of that Gamergate. Gamergate was this sort of harassment movement against women in gaming. Mm -hmm. But again, it's that like weaponizing the media and kind of using the internet to drive outrage and playing into these like kind of, you know, people have no media literacy in this country. And so they play into people's kind of worst instincts about the media. Well, or many people think they do have it. When they don't. <laughs> well, they believe, everyone believes they have media literacy. Meanwhile, they can't even tell when a TikToker is lying to them. I know, you know? exactly. Okay, so let's transition into uh, TikTok. You know, in your book, you say TikTok dominates, and, it, and I certainly believe it does as well. So tell me about TikTok right now, uh, fall of 2023. Where are we with the uh, platform? Yeah, I think the platform has finally matured. I mean, I think 2019, 2020, it was growing. 2022, I think it came into its own. I think 2023, it's very saturated now. It's very hard to grow, obviously, for that reason. But um, it really is kind of the home of pop culture. It's where these pop culture, these narratives emerge. It's where I always say it's like YouTube and Twitter combined. It's like that real time kind of news focus of Twitter with the format of YouTube, but sort of packaged in short form content. I think commentary culture has become huge. There's so much analysis videos on everything under the sun on TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, it's really shaping a lot of people's sort of worldview and, and thoughts on things as they're consuming that type of stuff rather than, you know, reading opinion columns. And things. Yeah. And certainly um, on the one on the one hand, too, it's become a search platform, you know, just yeah. for information. Oh, hugely. Yeah. So hugely. I mean, I know we're talking about a lot of the scary parts of, you know, the Internet culture and social media, but there's a lot to be said about. Uh, the benefits of using it as well. Um, I was happy to see that you touched on this. Uh, when you see the dominance of a TikTok, why does TikTok, su- where does TikTok succeed where Clubhouse failed? Yeah. Oh, God. So many things. Um, I mean, the main thing, and I talk about this a lot in my book, is this like um, sort of how you view your user base. TikTok has always been very, very much like, for the users. Like they don't, they don't try and force feed people down their throats. I know, but there's all these conspiracies. Oh, they force fed Charlie. Demille. No, it's pretty engagement. It's very tailored to your own interests, your own engagement and what people engage with to an insane degree. And based off data, based off a lot of interactions, Clubhouse made this mistake where they tried to like force feed content to their users. It's the same mistake that Elon is making now. It's a doomed, same with Vine. They all try to do this and it's always doomed. With Clubhouse, they made their whole suggested user list, like Andreessen Horowitz partners and people adjacent to their own investors. No one wants to hear from these people. I'm sorry. That is not a mass, you know, pop culture platform. And instead of really leaning into the content creators and building up the content creators, building protections for the content creators, which is what a lot of the biggest women content creators on that platform wanted, was just like basic safety protections. The founder, Paul, was like, screw that. No way. Let's We're making Mark Andreessen the biggest thing on the app. And nobody wants market. No, nobody cares what that man has to say. He's just some rich guy in Silicon Valley. Like he's not relevant at all to pop culture or mainstream culture. So 
I think that really hindered the app's growth at a critical time. Where do you think um, audio came into play in terms of, you know, just in terms of dominance or lack oh, of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think another thing that TikTok did, I mean, what TikTok has nailed is discovery too. And it's discovering new content, especially through audio tracks and music and stuff. Clubhouse was so weird because it was like, it, it was like theoretically this audio platform, but didn't really allow for audio discovery very well. And it wasn't tied in with music or anything that you'd want to like listen to. It was just like a lot of like chatter. Talks. Yes. Yes. Chatter. chatter from like a lot of scammers. It ended up being like the last few rooms I was in there before I deleted the app were like basically selling MLM schemes. Oh, no um, kidding. Oh, I got off yeah. before that. Oh, that's interesting. You got out at the right yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, TikTok is such a sophisticated product and, you know, they optimize everything to the most insane degree, but I think it's, I think it's going to be dominant for the coming years. And it's not going away. There will be no legislation that kills TikTok in your opinion. It would be so insane um, for that to happen. I was telling this to one of my colleagues and my colleagues like Taylor, they roll out bad legislation literally all the time, but it would be pretty unprecedented because we are not China and we are not India and we're not some of these other platforms where like the government controls our tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be pretty worrying. Also, TikTok's not remotely the only popular Chinese app. And if you want to worry about Chinese influence in entertainment, let's talk about all the Chinese money in gaming and the data that they're harvesting from gaming platforms and all this other stuff. Like, there's just a lot. Right. Those are, it's just so disingenuous. It's just, it's a lot of Facebook and Google um, lobbying, I think. Yes, I agree with you 100% on that. Okay, so you touched on it. Uh, we have to go here, especially with you. Let's talk about Twitter or formerly known as now X. Uh, okay. What are your feelings? All right, be Twitter. Tell me about your thoughts on Twitter. I stopped using it after I got banned. Elon suspended me for ask, after I asked him for comment on a story um, in December. And ever since I got back on, like people couldn't find my name. I couldn't find my stuff. It was my app was really broken and glitchy. And I just made the decision that I'm not going to use it for news anymore. So I use it. I tried to push as many people as possible to my Instagram and TikTok. But I mostly only use it now to keep up with like COVID information because I am high risk. And like, it's kind of this only place where like you can keep up with that stuff. But honestly, if it wasn't, if that wasn't on there, I just wouldn't even use it at all. But I kind of just use it for that because there's nothing else. Like I can't find it, but I don't use it for news or information at all. How My feed is worthless. Uh, I, I agree. Mine is the same. Absolutely worthless. How often do you post on Twitter at all? Yeah, but I like mostly just share other like COVID news related things mm -hmm. like because like, oh, we're in a surge or like, oh, I wrote this article like related to like, you know, I wrote an article last week about threads blocking the word vaccine in the middle of the booster campaign. And like, so sometimes I'll share things like that. I share a lot of information with other kind of medically vulnerable people. But no, I mean, I don't even put like, I don't even know if I, I talked about my book a couple times on there, but like, I get more engagement on threads and Mastodon than I do on Twitter. Yeah. So, um, so before we go there, cause that's where I wanted to go next. How did you know that you were, uh, that you were banned by Elon Musk? I was at a Christmas party. I was at my friend's house. Actually, she was having a few friends over cause I am, I'm high risk and I couldn't go to like this bigger Christmas party. So she was having a few friends over for drinks. And, um, I, uh, I was having some wine with Ryan Mack from the New York times and Tyler Kincaid from NBC. And I think it was Ryan or Tyler looked up and said, Taylor, I think you're banned from Twitter. I can't find you. I'm trying to tag you or something. And I was like, what? And I had just asked Elon for comment, like a couple hours. I asked oh. Elon for comment and then I left for the party. And, um, and I was like, shit. And then I realized that I was banned. And then I just started laughing so hard. It was, it was, I, I'll be honest. I had a glass of wine at that point and I was just, <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. So I, I mean, I remember when this happened, but I don't remember what did you do next. Like, where did I see you? I made comment? a TikTok. Was it TikTok? I made a, okay. Oh, I. In, are you kidding me? I immediately made a TikTok. I immediately went on Instagram Live and did an Instagram Live. I did a TikTok. Maybe that live. was, I was it. Like, yes. Let's talk about this. Like, let's talk about why I'm banned. And then I dropped my story, which exposed Elon's lies. And then Elon was forced to add me back on because he had tried to ban me under this stupid rule saying that I was promoting my Instagram account too much. Oh my God! Hold on one yeah. second. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Yep, that's fine. Oh my God. Whoa. A giant spider oh. crawled and I saw it crawling into my window. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw it coming into the window and I was like, I have to close my window right now before it comes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. No problem. Um, okay. Where were we? Okay. So, well, okay. So that's- Oh yeah. He tried to ban me. Well, he had to let me back on because he tried to ban me under this rule. Do you remember that weekend that he made the rule like 
you can't promote yourself on other platforms. At the time, my Instagram account was wiped and the only tweets that I had up were promoting my Instagram account. Yes. Okay. So. Yes. Now let's talk about like just Instagram into threads. You are very active on threads. And when I think of like, who is the first most prominent person on threads? It, like when I, I think I was pretty early adopter to it. It was just you. To me, it was like Taylor, <laughs> threads is tailored. So tell me what you think about threads. Like what, what did they do right in the launch? What did they still need to do? I'm noticing that you're dropping a lot of tips in there. Uh, so talk to me about threads. Oh yeah. I'm always like yelling about something. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to give feedback on the product. I, um, I think what they've done well is roll out a, a relatively competitive product to Twitter that sort of like allows people to do short, easy text posts, which I love, and share links, which is very rare these days to have a social platform that you can share links on. And as a journalist, I value that. Now, what have they done wrong? A lot. Because Adam Masari has a very contentious relationship, and I'm sympathetic. You know, Adam Masari ran Newsfeed during the height of the backlash against Facebook. He's very nervous about news. So he posted this thing right after Threads launches. I don't know if you remember. And it was like, we don't want to be a place for news. Like we want to be a place for like fun and entertainment and pop. like that's such a misguided notion. And again, as I wrote this story just last week about them blocking, for instance, the word vaccine in the middle of a booster rollout, like they, they overly moderate too heavily to the point that you can't actually talk about news. And that's a huge problem because it's, you know, there's this delusion that like pop culture, or entertainment or fashion or sports is somehow you know, non-political or not adjacent to like hard news and controversy, that is not true. There's mm -hmm. nothing that's not shaped by po politics mm -hmm. these days, of course, more than anything. And so, you know, what you end up doing when you block search terms, which I think is an insane, horrible precedent to set, is you cut off really important communication and specifically people speaking truth to power, like journalists' ability to report on, you know, powerful people telling lies and things like that. How did you know so that they couldn't yeah. use vaccine on threads? As a word. Um, oh, I got a tip from public health officials. Public health officials, actually, because the CDC had not updated their you know, website or guidance and stuff. Unfortunately, the CDC it lags behind. It's a government website. It is not meant to be a real-time news source. It is a government website. And so linking to the CDC is blocking all searches of COVID, long COVID, all these. It was all this like COVID-related stuff. However, when I talked to them on the phone, th that's not the only words they blocked. They blocked a lot more words. Some of them are like porn and things like that that you would expect. But some of them, it's like, we need to be able to talk. You, you need to be able to say the word porn sometimes on the internet. Right. That doesn't mean that you should be allowed to share porn or that they shouldn't moderate that. But again, it, this goes back to like news and talking about things. Mm -hmm. And you, you should be able to talk about things. And that's what really worries me about threads is that they're censoring conversation. That is really that you're never going to be a place for news. And I was bringing up the war in Ukraine, sorry, with the PR person. And it's like, I have a feeling, and I, I haven't confirmed this because it didn't happen, but the way that they were talking, it sounded like they would have banned the word Ukraine during the, you, when oh. that stuff came, like they just want to avoid quote unquote controversial terms. Interesting. So, uh, so you're saying you spoke, was this the PR person from Meta? Yeah. And so they, uh, see, that's an interesting business plan, but you I, I'm with you on this. And from my perspective of working in public relations, specifically, you know, issues management, crisis management. Twitter, as it once was, was the place to go for primary information because that was immediate. That's where it receives so much uh, yeah. clout, and that's where and that's why journalists also receive so much clout as well. I'm with you. It's an inform. It was it was born from like information and threads. Yeah. You know, for me, I find it just more like the goofy Twitter. It's just yeah. people's opinions and thoughts and. And I don't care about half the stuff they talk about on that app. I know. I want to love I think it. It's, I want to love I, it. Me too. Me too. And I think they have a real opportunity and I think they're squandering it because they're so afraid. And to be fair, I was talking to another source at, at Meta who was saw my posts and was reaching out to me like, you're being too hard on the company. Like, I think from the company's perspective, they're under a huge fire from legislators. Mm -hmm. Facebook has a horrible, you know, record of misinformation. Mm -hmm. They're almost too scared now where it's like they recognize this opportunity that that's created with Twitter's downfall, but they're too scared to really go for it. So they sort of like go through this like halfway thing, but then they're banning all these terms. And it's like, guys, let us talk about what we want. Moderates a little bit. Look, I'm not saying shouldn't have any moderation, but like these are newsworthy terms. You can't just block all quote unquote controversial terms that are newsworthy. That's 
what are people going to be posting about ice cream that they ate yesterday? It's boring. Yeah. And you're absolutely right about, you know, pop culture and any type of internet culture. It is tied so tightly with current events and because that's what, you know, it's news, current events. That's what popular culture is. It, that's exactly what it is. So every time I go to threads and honestly, I forget that it exists. It's only because when I see the squiggle and it comes up every time I go there, it's just people chatting about nonsense. I mean, you're really the only person who might come in and go, bam, you know, with something. But other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. So now just like moving forward, like looking forward, like the, for your book, Extreme Landline, what's the takeaway? What's the gist of the book? Well, I really want people to see this like user side of social media. I want them to understand the rise of social media, not just through the lens of these tech narratives and not just through the lens of like the social network and things like that. Like I really wanted to present this sort of alternative history of the social media, the rise of social media and the social web, and also tell the story of this half a trillion dollar content creator industry that's emerged with zero oversight, zero regulation. Like it's kind of the wild west still, and people don't take it seriously or understand how we got here. So yeah, I wanted to kind of set the record straight on stuff and obviously talk about a lot of stuff that I reported over the years that I think at the time people weren't paying attention to these things as much. There's a lot of lessons I think we can take from looking at the events of the past 20 years on the internet. If I were teaching uh, this semester, your book would be in the syllabus. Seriously. <gasps> that means so much. Oh my God. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Because I here's the thing that really that I loved about it. Like when I opened it up, the fact that you started, well, chapter two with mommy bloggers, because that is a lifetime ago. And so much of the, the social media network that we see right now is based on on, on that start for so many people who found success so quickly. And then they were able to monetize, you know, the, the, the audience so quickly. And a lot of those people are still here, but they haven't been able to continue and optimize it because everything has changed. And I love how you, how you, how you kind of plot and show the change and what happened there. I thought it was fascinating. Oh my God. Thank you. That means so much. And yeah, they literally mothered the the whole industry. So I think it was incredible what they did. They mothered the whole industry. I love that. Okay. So yeah. now, but what's next for you? You're, you have so much in your young years, you have done so much. <laughs> Are you going to keep doing the same thing for a while or is there any other type of uh, new life, next life for you? Yeah. I love media. So I'm going to stay in media in some way or form. I don't necessarily like feel like I have to be a writer forever. Um, I used to feel like I just needed this to be a beat. And if I didn't write the story, no one would write it. Now mm -hmm. there are more reporters in my beat, which I love. And I try to like keep them all. I feel very protective of all of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love writing. I love, I, I love other formats too. Like I think, cause I'm not, I, I write all day, but I'm a very visual audio person. I wanted, I had a Snapchat show for a while um, years ago. And I think I could do another thing like that. Maybe not on Snapchat, but like. Who knows what? I don't know. I'll just keep talking on the internet and I'll see what happens. Yeah, that's a, see, I, I, I think I'm a lot like you too. Like sometimes it's just, you take what you know and your knowledge and your passion. And then when it moves, I mean, there's constant turns and twists that are happening there. So I, that's why I love following you. I love your content. I love how you think. And I love that you're, you know, you're a badass too. You're not going to like, just let someone get the best of you and roll over you. You know, you have a passion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So in every episode, I always like to include an indestructible PR tip. This is usually one practical takeaway that I drop to help people build an indestructible reputation. But oh my goodness, I can't think of a better guest. Uh, someone listening right now, they are on the internet. You know, they're on social media. You've been there, done that. What do you think would be a good tip for just the average person online right now, how to navigate it in a way to keep their reputation safe, clean, and solid? Such a good question. Um, I'm trying to think for an average person because uh, okay. journalists are a little bit different. Okay, right? how about this then? We'll, we'll move it from someone who's average, but let's say it's like an influencer. Okay, okay so someone okay. could be verified, maybe not, but they have a following. They're in the couple hundred thousands. What should they worry I about? Say, I would say be careful before you insert yourself into controversy. Like, be careful. Not everyone needs to weigh in on everything. I mean, you would because you that's your job is to weigh in on like crises or whatever. I see so many people just like they're somewhat notable. And I've made this mistake, too, by the way. I've I've commented on things that I don't know about that I'm sort of unrelated to that I just see on the Internet. And then suddenly your name is in these news articles mm -hmm. and suddenly people are angry at you or you've issued an opinion or 
whatever. And so I just think it's like, if you see drama happening, save it for the group chat. You don't need to say something because if you have a slightly notable name, your name is going to end up in the articles and you're going to be on team so-and-so and cleaning up the mess. <laughs> it's just like, I you don't need love, to I That is the best tip because you're absolutely right. I've done the same thing. And I have made the decision to move away from opinion as much as I can and just become more of a subject matter expert to teach. Yeah. And I have noticed the amount of hate that has been reduced in the comments because you're absolutely right. They, people will drag you in. And I mean, me, my bugaboo is, are the social media vigilantes out there who <sighs> love to bring people down just for the sake of bringing people down. You, yeah. I mean, you must be a target for that, right? Yeah, all the time. I hate what that. do you do? I do you just, energy. do you just ignore it? Like, what do you do when people are taking you like crazy and they want to just like drag you into a drama? Oh, people are so mad. I mean, somebody did a tweet the other day and I got so mad about it. It was like someone with not that many followers, but they're like, oh, Taylor Lorenz is following XYZ problematic people, including one person that's a source for mine that actually was, has been a source for mine on some really major stories. And I'm just like, who is this? The follow police? Like wh who gives a shit? I'm a journalist. I follow tons of people that I don't ideologically agree with. Often, by the way, some of those people are the best leakers ever. Like, you know, you don't know what the, what these people are saying. So I was like, so annoyed by that. And I, anyway, I try to ignore it generally, but there's always those people that are like nipping or like, Oh my God, I accidentally liked a Drew Barrymore post when she was in the midst of her yeah. like chaos. I think it just came up on my feed and immediately someone's in the comment, oh, Taylor Lorenz, you support this? And I was like, no, I'm a member of a union. I don't support any strike breaking. Yes. Oh Sorry. my gosh. Sorry, I errantly liked this post. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay, so Taylor, you are everywhere and there. Where can people, first of all, where can they, so your book is going to be, by the time this comes out, your book will already be published. So I assume it's it's going to be It's everywhere. everywhere. Get the book. Yes. It's Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local bookshop. You can request it from your library. It's extremelyonlinebook.com. Um, also follow me on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. I guess threads. <laughs> threads <laughs> also. And uh, and uh, you have a newsletter. You're on Substack as well. And I do. TaylorLorenz.substack.com. Yes. Oh, Taylor, it was so great talking to you. I could talk to you forever. And honestly, I think every student should get this too. They should just read. Well, help okay. them in a million classes, I think. So I love it. I really, and this is now going to be like a resource book for me. I'm always going to have it here. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me. I loved having this conversation. It's so fun being in the same space with you here, but also on social media. Thank you. You too, Molly. I'm such a fan. So this is awesome. <laughs> mutuals, mutuals. All right. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks.